conclude the sermon series that I have been leading. And uh, today's message is about power. It is something else that God gives you. He's told us, I give you power. Now, the first week of this was, I love you. The second week is, I forgive you. Today is, I give you power. Three gifts that God gives us. And this power thing, I really want to talk to you about this. And I want you to be ready to open up your mind and your spirit to something that unfortunately is new to the church. It's a, it's a novel concept because we get in a rhythm of living and life, even as Christians. And we get used to not walking in power. You say, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I have some power. Well, indeed you do. But can anyone, including myself, say that I am walking in all of the manifested power that God intends for me to walk in? I can't. I don't know of anybody that really can. So every one of us need more. And the great thing is, is there a supplier that is up there and he is pouring it out on those who will receive that power. As you just heard this reading about tongues and, and everything, and a lot of people, they'll say, well, in, in a, one church says, well, they're, they're an unknown tongue. It's a heavenly language. Another church says, no, it wasn't that because the people heard their own languages. Another one says it was really, all that stuff has passed away. Uh, says it's better to prophesy. And the funny thing is, is all three camps really don't do much of any of it. They all have an opinion, but they're not walking in their own opinion. If it was many different languages, why aren't we having a language just manifest upon us so we could go down to Nicaragua without having to get, what's that, uh, Rosetta Stone booklet series or whatever? Why aren't we just flowing in that? Do you have to go take a couple of college courses to be able to walk in the Spirit? No. And learn that language? These guys spoke in many different languages instantly as the power of the Holy Spirit fell upon them. And they also prophesied for, for the camp that doesn't believe that we could talk in any tongues. They say, well, you should be prophesying. Well, I say, well, when's the last time you did? Uh, I, I, well, I just, you, know, that, you know, we're not walking in power. When God says we should be. My good friend was ministering to me. James Fields has been a pastor to me for more than this crisis. And he was praying with me because it's been it's been up and down. I mean, it's been unbelievable what you know we've been going through here from the doctors. And he said, Dave, he said, I'm just going to begin to pray. And he began to pray with the understanding, which is just like I would pray for you. And then he just got to a, a place where he didn't know what to say, and he broke out into his prayer language. And there he is on the phone just praying in tongues with me over the over the phone. What's happening, preacher, when that's happening? Well, when our heart's overwhelmed, we don't know what to say. We allow the Spirit of God to pray through us for what we really need. And I would prefer the Holy Spirit pray for me than me myself because he knows me better than I know myself. And I just sat there, had no clue what he was saying, but I just sat there and I said, God, be it unto me. Just, just fall over me. And, and he has been there for me and he has given me that strength. I've had a lot of of moments with the Lord during this crisis, as you have during your crisis. And it's in those times we need power. We need that promise of power, not something that we can work up. Let's go to Luke chapter 24, verses 40, verse 49. That's not it. <laughs> I'm sorry. That, that, uh, I, I'm, I'll, go ahead, I'll go ahead and paraphrase. It says, but I give you power. The Lord gives us power to overcome. The Lord has provided for us power in our times of need. And he says, I want to give you that so you can walk in that power. So the way that I translate this out is a superpower. There's a lot of comic books out there talking about superpowers, the X-Men, the, the, the League of whatever, of superheroes, from the Ninja Turtles to you name it. As a child, you all, you know, experienced power. And I had a video, but our, our Internet is down at the church, and Jesse has managed to work this through his telephone. And I want you to hear this is something from the 50s, and it's, it's see if you recognize what this is. Go ahead, Jesse, see if you can do that, buddy. Up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Yes, it's Superman. 
strange visitor from another planet who came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. Superman, who can change the course of mighty rivers, bend steel in his bare hands, and who, disguised as Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper, fights a never-ending battle for truth, justice, and the American way. Another exciting episode. That's good, buddy. The rest of the video is him fighting these guys, and it's just hilarious. You know, a guy breaks a pot over his head, and he deflects a few bullets and, and pushes a guy down and stuff, and you watch all this. and Superpower. Of all the superheroes, Superman's the man. I mean, why would you want to be Batman? You know, Batman needs armor to protect himself. Superman just didn't, you know. I mean, Superman was the guy. He had X-ray vision, right? He could, he could blow a, a tide another way. He, he, he was just... The ultimate superpower. Well, the Lord has come to give us power, and that more abundantly. God wants you to have a power. So my question to you today, speaking of power, is what superpowers do you possess? Oh, yeah, I've got it written down here. Pause. I'm pausing. (laughs) Think about it. What's your superpower? What does the devil shake in his shoes over what you do? When you walk into a room and you, you, what power do you bring to bear? What you got? Is it x-ray vision? What is it? What what do you have? You're a Christian. Yes, ma'am. You're a Christian. You're supposed to change a room when you walk in. You're supposed to light it up. I watched mom yesterday during communion. When we began singing, Joe Chaplin, who came over from Djibouti, got, he came off the ship. He was deployed, eight-month deployment. He's sitting there with his guitar, and we're all sitting around, and we're singing the songs of the cross before communion. And mom, when you say, hi, mom, love you, there's been times I've kissed her on the forehead, you know. Edward and I have kissed her on the forehead so many times there's a rash up there, I think. And, you know, it's like we walk in and she says, hi, Dave, you know, you know. But when we started singing the songs of the cross, my mom lit up like a Christmas tree. I mean, it was all over her. It was obvious of the person that she loved the most. I told you last week what we did with Tara, you know. And uh, well, early on in this sickness when mom was uh, really having uh, a hard time and, and she was about to go into surgery and they'd given her some some feel good uh, medicine before she went in there and sort of a truth serum and I was really bold and because uh, mom's always called me her sparkler you know and uh, and and I, I thought well I'm definitely I'm just going to show Edward and Tara who the, who the favorite is I said mom who's your favorite she when she said Tara <laughs> bam <laughs> it sunk my boat you know when the truth serum really came out but. <laughs> But when we sang about Jesus, mom's superpower came out. And there were times when, when we would be praying. And my mom, my mom would pray, Jesus, 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 Jesus. This is not a brain echo thing. My mom has always prayed like that. When, one of my, when, when me or Edwards, our grades weren't good enough, or Edward was in trouble, or this, or we, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And you know what the Lord heard? Touch David, touch Edward, make him smarter. Do, you know that? I mean, she could say one word over and over and over and over and over and over, and over again, and the Lord was hearing what mom's heart was saying. Mom's superpower is prayer. And she loves Jesus. That's her power. What's yours? What have you got? We should all have a superpower. What have you asked God for in your life to make you more effective in his kingdom? Or have you been asking him for a better job to help your kingdom? Have you asked him for a better title and more respect at work to help your kingdom? Look, that's okay. I'm all for you prospering and being in good health. But when was the last time you said, Lord, give me power so I can be more effective where I am, so I can be... A competent ambassador of Christ. Or is it good enough for you to just slug on an average Christian that's going to make it to heaven? That's a dirty word in my vocabulary. It never worked for mom. 
You bring home a C. <laughs> to me, it was like, da, 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 da. You know, and mom's saying, oh, honey, any bonehead can make a C. <laughs> Average isn't good enough, especially to the Christian. You are excellent. When I compliment people, I will thank, I, will, I probably complimented many of you like this. Thank you for your excellence. I'm not thanking for your average. Thank you for your excellence. Because I want to encourage people to be excellent because that is what God deserves. And that's what He's put inside of you. And it's our job to allow that to become a superpower. You're, you're supposed to have it. I'm supposed to have it. We're supposed to have the answers because we know the answer. The king of the kingdom, the king of the universe knows my name. And I'm his friend. So, Johnson, what kind of power do you have? Have you been clothed in power? That's what that scripture says, Jesse. That was it. He said, because he has clothed us. In power. That's who we are. He didn't just save you. But he has clothed you with power. So where is that power coming out? How are you affecting your work environment? If you're laughing at their dirty jokes. It's not power my friend. If they think that you're high and mighty and and repulsed by their presence. That's not power either. The average person, the average Christian is just saved. Now, I know you say, oh, just saved. That's a great thing. It is. But that's step one. The Lord saves you. He repairs you. The Lord fixes you. And then the plan is to equip you and to clothe you with power. So that the devil wants you off this earth so fast he doesn't know what to do. But with so many people, the devil's not even worried about us. As long as we're willing to slug along in mediocrity and average Christianity. The average Christian doesn't want to be bothered with the responsibility or the accountability of power. They don't. Well, that's for those other people. Uh, Somebody else pray. Somebody else pray. And a lot of your time... When it comes out of that, you're just hoping and praying that somebody else will pray so you don't have to do that. Come on, friend. We're better than that. I want you to say this. Repeat this to me. Say, I am better than that. You are. You really are. Be above the average. Be willing to accept the responsibility of power because you've got more than Superman. The average Christian doesn't even change his world. As a matter of fact, the average Christian looks more like his world than he does the kingdom of heaven. Is that disappointing to anybody but me? We're better than this. We can do better things. It shouldn't be a novel idea for you to to take that horse by the reins and say, I'm tired of this thing Lead me where I'm going. I'm going to change the environment in my work. I'm going to forgive somebody. I'm going to be kind to someone. I'm going to take someone by the hand and I'm going to pray with them with authority. That is power. When we begin to change our surroundings, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority or all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, fellas, some of the disciples go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. It's not just preachers that baptize. It's not just preachers that pray for people. Disciples do these things. Disciples reach into, a, into the hand of a, a person who is on the brink of just hopelessness and says, silver and gold I don't have, but what I have I'm going to give to you. Let, may I pray for you? And then you just pray and say, God, touch my friend right now. You'd be shocked at how people respond to that. As a matter of fact, their faith might even surpass yours. 
I've had people that I've prayed for, their faith was stronger than mine. Because when I opened my eyes, I wasn't really expecting any change. And I opened my eyes and they were lit up. And I thought, wow, that works. <laughs> when I do what the Lord to- tells me to do, it's incredible. Whoa. And it pushes me to do more. It encourages me to do more. The Great Commission. How do we fulfill the Great Commission? It is fueled by power. That's how we do those things. Through power. Not through knowledge and understanding. Power. God, I don't know what I'm going to say. I don't know, I don't know what to say. And you know what he tells you to do? He says, open your mouth and I'll fill them. How many of you have that much faith to say, I'm not really sure, but I'm just going to go. And then you go in there and then you just, God just fills your mouth with words. I'm going to tell you the honest truth. When I go into most hospital rooms, most funeral homes, and most homes where people have lost someone in their life, I say, God, you need to talk to them. I don't. <laughs> you really need to do something here because I don't know what to say. And then I say, God, you work to me. You know what sometimes God does? He just causes me to be quiet. And sometimes he gives me things to say. But whatever I do, it is through power. Paul said, we don't come to you with enticing words of man's wisdom, but we come to you in power. And that is what the church needs today. He's given us love. He's given us forgiveness. And let's not forget the fuel to love and forgiveness. And that is power. Today, if you're not sure, before you leave here today, I want you to say, God, I want to walk in power. I need to walk in power because that is what your commission is fueled by. And it's power. Jesus was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was sustained by the fellowship with his father through the power of prayer. Jesus healed and performed miracles by the power of Of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was raised from the dead. By the power. Of the Holy Ghost. Producers have. Power. Producers are people that walk in power. Because they are clothed. Or endued. With power. From on high. He says go and pray. Till you be endued. With power. Clothed. With power from on high. Not just a quick. Change. Whoop, I'll take that right off. I need it back on again. Oh, okay, take it back off. Somebody needs prayer? Put it back on. I'm not going to take it back off because I'm going to live in the world. No. Be clothed. Walk around in a vestment of power. That is what we're supposed to be. But we're a lot like some of us preachers. We wear, our, I got one right back there. We wear our fancy robes from church, but when service is over, zip, unhook, and hang it up. I'd feel funny walking around town with that. And so would you. (laughs) What's that guy's deal? Oh, he's that preacher from from New Tabor. Does he ever take that thing off? I don't know. What's he up to? I don't know. You know, maybe I ought to do it. Maybe I ought to do it as a living testament, the fact that we at New Tabor are not going to take our power off. And when people ask me, I'll say, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm keeping this on because I I don't want to take my power off on Sunday like we all do. Are you with me? Don't worry, I won't do that to you. <laughs> Let's don't take it off. Because I'm going to tell you what you're going to need power for. You're going to need power to forgive people. I can't begin to tell you how many Christians have been walking around for decades and decades and decades and decades and decades with hurts, offensives, that threaten their ability to even receive the Lord's table. And many of them have defiled the Lord's table by walking up here with unforgiveness and bitterness in their heart and receiving Holy Communion. Because it takes power to forgive. It goes beyond a commitment to forgive. It takes power to forgive somebody. Especially when you have been unjustly wronged. And you're still mad. And you want that other person to hurt. When Christ has died for your sins. And forgiven you of your sins. It takes power to be kind. It takes power to be peaceful. It takes power to have faith. 
And if you're not walking in a vestment of power, then the Bible says you're as a sounding brass and a tinkling symbol. You're just an ornament. You're not real. You know what the world calls us? Do I need to go there? They call us hypocrites. And they look at us and they say, why do I need to go there to be that way? I already am that way. I can take off the the clothes when I leave church too and be my normal self every other hour of the day. If your language changes on Monday, you're not walking in power. Amen? If you have to watch how you think, if you have to be really careful and constantly, you know, uh, you know, Put that first nature down. Let me see. Your first nature should be Christ. Your first nature should be to please Him. And you shouldn't put on your Sunday face when you come to church. It should be your Saturday night face on Sunday morning. Can I get an amen in the congregation? (laughs) We need to walk in power. Not take it off after the sermon. I want you to be people of power. I want to be a threat to the devil. And when he thinks of New Tabor, I don't want him to go, oh, yeah, that bunch, yeah, yeah, they just, <laughs> whatever. I want him to go, you know what? We need to have another committee meeting to, to, to deal with this. This is a problem. They are becoming a problem in our community. Because they let anybody come to their church. It doesn't matter what their race, color, or creed, or their language is. They have faith. When they pray, they believe that God's going to do some things. And when people need prayer, they'll stick their hand out and grasp the hand of somebody else and pray for them. Not even asking them what they believe. They just love people. That is a problem. And you know what? When when it seems like that God has forgotten them and He doesn't answer every prayer they pray, they don't question God. They don't look at God and say, why would you do this? They just love Him anyway. I've even heard them say, no matter the outcome, God, I will love you. It takes power. It takes power. The question I want to ask you. No, let me just go to Acts chapter 1. I'm going to ask you some questions. Acts 1, verses 8 and 9. This is what Jesus tells them before he leaves the disciples. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. And now they're standing there. The last thing he told us before he went to the Father, I'm going to give you power, David. Am I walking in that? Has the Holy Ghost come upon you? I want you to think about that. Have you asked the Holy Ghost to come upon you? What's going to happen? Who cares? Do you want the Holy Ghost to come upon you and consume you with power? That's what I want to know. Spiritual people are in two types. There's the aggressive and then there's the passive. Guess which one I am. I'm not not a big pacifist. I'm not a Neville Chamberlain in history. The guy who went to Hitler and said, yeah, whatever you want to do, I'll go back and tell England, and it's okay, let's sign a treaty. And he signed a treaty with the devil, and the rest is tragic history. As England just put their arms down and let him destroy six million Jews. I'm not a pacifist. A pacifist is concerned with his own borders. As long as I'm okay, it's all right. I'm going to take care of myself. Uh, those people down there are starving and this, uh, we're, God's blessed us. And if they were like me, they probably wouldn't be starving. Bless the Lord. He's concerned with his own borders. A pacifist has not prepared himself to defend his faith. A pacifist is satisfied with mediocrity in the things of God. He'll let other people do his work and do his heavy lifting. He'll go sit in his chair. A pacifist is powerless When crisis comes. When somebody needs you, you are AWOL, absent. You'll you'll look for someone else to stand in your place. The aggressive, the offensive Christian is concerned with a dying and lost world. It bothers her. It bothers him. Just the thought of people dying every second and going into eternity without Jesus Christ bothers them. And they put action. They don't just feel bad about it. 
They find ways to do something to change that order. The aggressive has a weapon. They have a weapon of their warfare. They've equipped themselves with spiritual warfare. They're ready. They have a, they know what their arsenal is. Their arsenal is a confession in their mouth and the testimony. They, they have something to combat the enemy. They overcome through power when crisis comes, not sitting there helplessly. They do things. Two different kinds of Christian. Which one are you? Has the Holy Ghost come upon you? What's your superpower? I'm asking questions that you need to answer between you and God. I want you to confront yourself. I like confronting myself. I do it all the time. I really do. And when I confront myself, and that's what the, the Holy Spirit's moving me, and what I do is I bring my flesh into order. It's what I do. You say, preacher, you're asking these tough... I've asked myself these questions. I'm giving you what I give in myself. Because I want to matter. We're saved by power. We are kept by power. We are equipped by power. We are sustained by power. We are raised by power. Everything in the Christian walk is by power. Christians are meant to be people of power and not weakness. So I want to encourage you to power. You need to be faster than a speeding bullet. You need to be more powerful than a, than a rushing locomotive. You need to be a man and a woman and a child, a teenager of power. There's something different about that person. And that difference in you is not weakness. It is power in your life. And that will attract the unsaved and the unbeliever. They will watch you in crisis. And if you blubber and fall to pieces like wet noodles, they'll go, I can do that. But when they see you behave yourself with power and with faith, they say, I want that. And they may not even know what it is, but they want it to be the truth and the life. Matthew chapter 10, verses 1. Almost done here. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits. How many of you are disciples? Raise your hand. Come on now. Has the Lord given you authority to drive out impure spirits? Yes. And he gave them Authority to heal every disease and sickness. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. He says, go first to them. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. And he said, heal the sick. How about this one? Raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out. I like that. Drive out demons. Don't open the door and sort of shoo them out. Drive them out, he said. Freely you have received, freely give. This is why James and John were called the sons of thunder. These two fishermen, disciples, after they walked in that intoxication of power, they had been driving demons out, raising the dead, healing the sick. They'd been doing these things. And they went back to Jesus and said, those Samaritans rejected our message. Do you want us to call fire down from heaven? They they were taking up a notch. So they were known as the sons of thunder because they were flush with power. And the difference between these disciples and us is time, not promise. I want you to ask the Holy Ghost to come upon you. Clothe yourself with power. Acts chapter 1 verses 10 and 11. Now, this is after Jesus has told them, To go, preach, disciple, baptize. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going away. When suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. Come on, guys. Get to work. You've been given power. Stop staring at the sky. The church today, by and large, 
We have been caught flat-footed, staring at the sky, saying, Lord, come back and take us out of this rat hole. When this rat hole needs us to occupy in power and change and affect this world. Amen? Amen. If I was in the Pentecostal church, I'd be running the aisles right now for that one, I guarantee you. In Acts chapter 2, they received power and they stopped gazing. And they changed the world as we know it. You are living evidences of that. Because we are a world away following Christ, loving Him, because those guys decided we're going to walk in power. Before we do it, we got to get power. So they said, Holy Ghost, come upon us. And they gave their lives because of their intoxication with this great commission. What superpowers do you possess? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for love. Thank you for forgiveness. Now, I accept the responsibility of power. I am not going to wait for someone else. This is my time. This is my age. And Lord, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen through people like me. I hope this is the prayer of the people with their heads bowed. I pray that they will join me and do their best to be peaceful, loving, forgiving, praying, powerful people. People that will dare To ask you to do things that are impossible. People that will dare. To stand up the way John and James did. And the rest of the disciples. And do great things in your name. Father I pray. That when we leave here. We will not take our vestments off. But we will rather clothe ourselves. And however it happens in each individual. Doesn't matter to me. We need to walk in power. So, Father, we pray that your power will clothe us. In Jesus' name, everyone who agrees said, Amen. Amen. Stand with me, please. Let's sing to the Lord. Take time to be holy, the first and last. our benediction. How many of you have seen some of the Super Bowl commercials? Several years ago, there was a Super Bowl commercial. I think it was a car commercial. I forgot which car brand it was. Little boy walking through the house. He has his Darth Vader costume on. If you don't know who Darth Vader is, ask me afterwards. I'll tell you. But he's walking around. The music's going bum, 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 bum. He walks up to the, to the washing machine and goes... And he's trying to make things happen with his power. And he has no power. He walks out to the car. He's undeterred. He's trying to make things move and trying to think. And he he goes out to the car after dad gets home. And he looks and stands in front of the car. And he does his hands and the car starts. 
And he's shocked and surprised that it actually worked. And, of course, the commercials, the, the father saw him doing it, and he pushed the, the, the ignition button on his keychain. And I thought, wow, the kid never gave up. Listen, I would be thrilled if you Christians went around town in your, little, in your little vestments, and you're doing this to everything. God just might surprise you. Are you hearing me? Don't give up. Don't, be, don't get tired of doing the right things. People need you to love them and pray for them. Who knows? God may just shock both of you and do something unbelievable. Amen? Amen. Go with God in power. You may be dismissed. God bless you. Amen. Amen.